Greetings, health scholars, and welcome back to the For Health Scholars channel. If this is your first time tuning in, welcome, welcome, welcome. My name is Dr. Arubasa, and on this channel, I show current and aspiring healthcare professionals how to, one, quickly and successfully earn their degrees, and two, how to start, build, and enjoy profitable careers within the business side of the healthcare industry. So definitely subscribe to the channel and definitely turn on your post notifications. I promise you don't want to miss out. Now, today you're definitely in for a treat. I am hosting the first ever guest interview series on the channel. And so if you are new to the channel, on going forward, I'll be doing guest interviews and just speaking with different professionals in the healthcare field or associated with the healthcare field or individuals who have businesses that can support you, whether it's productivity, academically, or in your career and just having some candid conversations with them because I'm not the only expert in the field. And so tonight joining me for the first ever conversation is a mentor of mine. She is actually the person who encouraged me to move forward and even create for health scholars and put it on YouTube. And so I'm excited to speak with her today. Her name is Dr. Toyin Ali. And just a little bit about Dr. Toyin. She is a former McNair scholar and received a PhD in mathematics. And she works for her dream job, which is being a professor, a senior lecturer, actually, at the University of Georgia. She started her own company called the Academic Society. And this is where I have worked with her hands on. And like I said, she gave me the courage to just start the For Health Scholars platform. And in her business, the Academic Society, she helps graduate students succeed by providing productivity and self-care tips and time management skills and tips to really help you thrive in, in your academic journey as a graduate student. So I'm super excited to have her on. She also has a YouTube channel. She has two, actually. So she has the Academic Society, and she also has her personal YouTube channel, which is more for academics who are interested in going into the business side and packaging their knowledge and sharing it with others. So without further ado, join me and welcome in our first guest, Dr. Toyin Ali. Hello. Thank you. Hi, Toyin. I am so excited to have you here. Thank you so much for joining. I know that you are such a busy professional, but the fact that you've given me an hour of your time today. I really, really appreciate it. So welcome to the For Health Scholars channel. I am super excited to have you here. And today we're going to talk about productivity and self-care, why it's essential to healthcare graduates particularly, but just any professional who is going for a master's degree or a doctoral degree. We have both been in your shoes. <laughs> and we know that um, not only just achieving the academic side and being good at it, but you need to take care of yourself. So I'm so excited about that. So Twain, we could start off by you just telling us a little bit about yourself. I shared your bio, but I'll let you take it from there. Yes. Hi. Hey, everyone in the um, in the comments. I'm so OK, you can see them. <laughs> yeah, I, can't. Well, I click the little button to see it. So, yes. OK, so I'll put it up here. So, yeah. uh, um, so before you start, let me actually welcome people. And so people are here. Uh, so we have Shayna. Hi, Shayna. Welcome. Um, we have Kenya. Hi, Kenya. Welcome back. Kenya is always supporting us here on the Health Scholars channel. I'm so excited about that. Hi, Ebony. Um, Ebony, I know you from LinkedIn, so I'm excited that you made it over here on YouTube. I see Jade is here as well. Hi, Jade. Thank you. Thank you for coming in. Just let us know where you are tuning in from. That would be helpful. And while you're doing that, that I'm just going to let Dr. Toyin tell us a little bit more about herself and her journey on becoming Dr. Toyin Ali. Yes, I'm so happy to be here. Thank you for inviting me. I <laughs> love to talk about this. So any <laughs> chance I can talk about time management and productivity and self-care in grad school, I'm so excited to do it. Um, so a little bit about me. I'm actually from Mississippi and in in like um, all through school, really the only subject I ever enjoyed was math. So much so that I went to what I call nerd school. I went to the Mississippi <laughs> School for Math and Science, which is actually a public boarding school in Mississippi. And almost all of our teachers had PhDs. We lived on a college campus. It really kind of gave me, gave me a great start into um, going to college and like pursuing 
mathematics, which I actually didn't realize I wanted to pursue, even though I loved it. So when I first started undergrad at the University of Mississippi, I was a biology major and my goal was to be an optometrist, an eye doctor, because, you know, when a child is you know, deemed quote unquote smart, all the older people around that child is like, you should be a doctor or a lawyer. So I felt, I felt like being an optometrist was like low stakes and not as scary as being like a brain surgeon or something like that. But in the summer, before I started my freshman year of undergrad, I joined this, I was part of this uh, summer program called the Summer Bridge Program, which is for um, students who are underrepresented in STEM. And so we took two college courses, two lab prep courses, and I ended up helping everybody in their math classes, like everybody. And I was like, I love math so much. Why am I not majoring in it? So I majored in math, and then I did some summer research programs in math, and that led me to grad school. And so I went to grad school at the University of Alabama to get a PhD in math. I had no idea what I wanted to do with the career. I was just like, I love math so much. Of course, I want to keep learning about it. And eventually, I became a graduate teaching assistant, having to teach two classes every single semester, sometimes two different classes. And I was like, I love this so much. I love helping these students understand math, like especially the ones who like hated math and were afraid of math. I took it as like a personal challenge to show them that they can do it and they can even enjoy it. And so from there, I got a job teaching math at the University of Georgia and started my business, the Academic Society, and here we are today. I am so excited to have you here. And I definitely can relate. Um, yeah, I grew up with a Nigerian dad and in his mind is, and most Nigerian parents, there are only like five acceptable professions and being a doctor is one. Now being a doctor of anything can suffice pretty much. Uh, but for the most part, Part, I definitely can relate to you when you got into the field um, or academia and you realize, okay, as a graduate and teaching assistant, I do love instilling knowledge into other professionals who have been in the same place as I used to be in. And so I am so excited to have, have you here. And for those of you tuning in, we're very very much live. And so um, it, I'm here speaking with Dr. Toyin Ali. She is our first guest on the Health Scholars platform. So please show her some love in the comment section. And so I see that Jade says she's from Fort Lauderdale. So thank you, Jade. And she's adding you on LinkedIn right now. So I'm excited about that because I tell you, you all the time here on the channel. Networking is key. So um, definitely add her on LinkedIn. She's also on Instagram at the Academic Society. I think it's an underscore in front of that. Um, on LinkedIn is Dr. Toyin Ali. And she's also on Facebook. And um, I think it's the Academic Society as well. So definitely connect work and connect and network with her. She has what you need to give you productivity, self-care, and guidance if you want to embark on a career in academia. So you answered the next question I had, which talked about what made you decide to embark on a career in academia. So I'm going to ask you this question. Can you tell us about your experience with academic productivity and what led you to start the academic society? Because your mathematics <laughs> major background, you're working in academia. So where does this productivity, time management, self-care component fit in into the journey of becoming Dr. Toy and Ailee? Yes, I think it's like very innate. I've always been great with like organization. I've always been able to like prioritize things and manage my time. And something that I noticed when I was in grad school was that a lot of the other grad students in my program had no idea what they were doing when it was coming to like time management and productivity. They were putting things off into the last minute. They were like piling on their work. They were working for hours on end. They didn't have any free time, any time for themselves. And I really think that my time management skills was one of the things that made me have like a positive experience in grad school. So when I finished grad school, I was like, I really want to help graduate students in a way that's like easy for me to help, but something that they need, right? It, I feel like time management and productivity is like one of those things where you're expected to do it well, but you're never actually taught how to do it. So I was like, okay, well, how can I help graduate students like 
gain the skills that were so helpful for me when I was in grad school. So I did, I was just like you, I started a YouTube channel. I started <laughs> talking about how I organized my days, how I managed my time. And I actually thought that I could only help graduate students who were in like math and science because mm. that's what I experienced. That's what yeah. I knew like what their programs were like. But it turns out everyone was interested in what I had to say from like all different fields. And so it turns out time management, productivity, self-care, these are like skills that every graduate student needs. And so, yeah, that's kind of how I started talking about it. Yeah, no, I love that because it's, you're right. Nobody teaches you like time management management, productivity, then you get into this rigorous program, especially at the graduate level, and you're expected to excel at everything that you do, pass all your classes and still be sane. And um, nobody really teaches you that. So that's why I definitely wanted to bring you on because with our community, there are many people who are transitioning into the field or they're advancing in the field and all of it can be stressful at times, especially when you're trying to find a job <laughs> or pass a class. And so we need your services. So um, you, as an academic, you definitely know what academic rigor is. And so I want you to just explain to the audience a little bit about academic rigor and the role it plays in curriculums because um, the stress that people are feeling is this. <laughs> students rather are feeling is academic rigor. Yes. Well, while I had the time management and the productivity down, I didn't have the academic rigor down when I first started grad school. I remember taking this class called Topology, and it was a class I had never heard of. I had never learned anything about it before, and I took it in my first semester of grad school. And, you know, I thought I knew how to study math. I've always done well. I've been a great test taker my whole life. But in this class, there was just more expected of me than I had anticipated. And I didn't know how to rise to the occasion. Like I just used my same old study skills that I had as an undergrad and they did not suffice. I actually got an incomplete in that class. I guess my professor's being generous. So instead of giving me a C, I got an incomplete and I had to meet with him every week in the next semester to prove everything from that class one-on-one, -on -one. like just me at the board with this math professor and I'm like proving things from scratch and there were tears. But at the end of that experience, I realized, oh, this is how you study and learn math. It takes more than whatever couple of hours I was doing. I needed to be consistently engaging with the material. I needed to be reading before class, which I didn't realize was a thing. <laughs> I needed to be reading my textbook before class. I needed to be um, engaging in class and then following up after class and going to office hours and then talking to my peers about the thoughts that we're having. And I just feel like it's something that you never really understand until you get into the graduate program and you realize, oh, this is a different level than what I experienced. And so I'm not sure how it is in like other fields, but like in math, it's not just, you know, computations. We're writing, we're proving things and we're gaining deeper and deeper knowledge into the subject matter. Yes. And that's what I tell my students all the time at the undergraduate level. I'm like, undergrad, you know, it's a mixture of things. But when you get to the graduate level, it is about writing. And in the health sciences, depending on what um, sector you are studying under the health sciences umbrella, we do have to do statistics. We do have to do some of the math work. I, I remember for for me, the class was accounting for non, uh, uh, like non-accounting professionals or for healthcare professionals, and that class used to drive me nuts because not only did you have to do the calculations, but you had to explain how did you get this, and if the spreadsheet did not balance out, you are going to be stressed. You going to get the answer wrong. So definitely understand that component. But I just wanted you to share that um, to our audience, because for many of the students, when you're starting to feel that pressure, and it's usually about midway towards the semester or towards the end, you're like, okay, it's really intense. And we call that academic rigor. It is embedded in almost every curriculum <laughs> from university to university. So even if you go to a new school, nine out of 10 times, that academic rigor is going to be embedded in there. And so um, thank you 
for that answer. So the next question I have for you is we talk about productivity, but how do you define this concept of productivity? Because it is very subjective from person to person. So we would love to know from you, what is productivity and how can we define that? Oh, that's a great question. So to me, productivity is actually sitting down and doing exactly what you plan to do and even finishing it. And that sounds so basic, but so many of us sit down with this like huge to-do list, get kind of stuck in the emails or get stuck on one thing. And that's the only thing that gets done for the day. And it, it makes us feel like we were like a failure for the day. We, we're looking at this long list of things that we need to do and we're still on number one and we haven't even finished it, right? So productivity is being able to know exactly what you're sitting down to do. So not even like sitting down and deciding, what am I gonna do for today? Let me figure that out. Having a plan, already knowing what you're gonna do for the day, sitting down, actually doing it with minimal distractions and then getting up and leaving and going on to other things and not keeping that thing in your brain or on your mind for the rest of the day. Absolutely. And somebody commented, let me see, um, Shana, she says, I'm in a master's of health informatics and undergrad is definitely different. And yes, informatics has a calculations component to to it because you're designing like healthcare systems. So the EHR systems that they use in the hospital, in the clinics, you have to design that and you have to make sure that it's functional <laughs> for everybody in the health system to use. So definitely when you get to that graduate program, Shana, it is quite different. A lot of writing and a lot of um, using outside literature to support your thoughts. So thank you for sharing those sentiments. Okay, so my next question to you, Dr. Twain, is productivity the same as self-care? Oh, that's a good question. So I would say self-care fuels your productivity, right? I always tell my students, you can't do math on a tired brain, right? So you have to actually take the time to take care of yourself to make your productivity sessions more efficient and actually valuable. So for example, let's say that I have something due like, I don't know, maybe around noon tomorrow and I'm working and it hits like 11 p.m. And for me, I'm a morning person and I don't think very well in the evening. So do you think the quality of my work is going to be very strong between the hours of 11 a.m. and one in the morning? Or would it be a better idea for me to just take a little break, go to bed, get a full night's sleep and get back to work at 7 or 8 a.m.? Like, would the quality of my work be better when I'm more rested and am working in my optimal time for working? Or would my quality work still be okay if I'm like super tired and drained? What I imagine is I'm probably working way more efficiently in the morning when I'm rested. Like something that would take me two hours at 11 p.m. would probably take me 30 or 45 minutes at 7 a.m. So taking care of yourself is so the thing that's going to fuel your productivity, right? So when we go to sleep, it just like resets the brain and like gives the brain new life so that you can actually do the things you want to do the next day. And so when we're sleep deprived, all of a sudden work is so much harder. You're making more mistakes and the time that you're spent working is not as quality. So you might as well use that time to rest. So it's not the same, but it's a component. Yes. Um, for me, I'm a night person. So like anything in the morning, like after I'm like really at my peak after 12 to like five, then I need a break in between there. And then from like seven until midnight, one, two, three o'clock in the morning, I can be up. Like that's how my mind is wired. And I think part of that is from my doctoral program uh, when I used to work full time and then teach <laughs> and then have to write my papers. Uh, I really was team no sleep for the most part part, but I find that that is not always the best for um, a scholar. And so definitely knowing that productivity is not the same as self-care, but knowing that it uh, self-care fuels the component of productivity. So what are some key factors that every scholar must embrace as they are creating their productivity routine? Yes. So you made a great point just now. You're a night owl. I'm a morning person. Some people are best in the middle of the day. Mm -hmm. So the first thing I always say is 
know yourself. What are your optimal conditions to like get the best work done? When do you personally get your best work done? For me, it's going to be in the morning before lunch. That's when my best work gets done. That's when I'm going to schedule being productive. For you, maybe it's like 1 p.m. to 5 p.m. Maybe that's when you get your best work done. So it might be more helpful to schedule your productivity time during your optimal performance time. Also, understanding how and where you work best. For me, I like to be sitting at a desk or in an office to get my work done. I know if I sit on the couch, I'm just going to turn the TV on and then not pay attention to anything. Also, I can't do work in my bed because for me, my, my brain says, we go to sleep here. So I'm not going to get work done here. So I would say number one is knowing yourself and knowing when, where, and how you work best so that you can like schedule your time to do your work there. Also, I would say um, prioritization. So this is a skill that takes time to learn how to do well, but it's so important. So prioritization is just knowing that not everything in your life or work or school is going to have the same level of importance or impact on your goals. So you working in one area versus another area has a different impact on your life and your work and your schoolwork, right? So you have to decide what's most important for you this week. What is the thing that you want to spend your time doing? And so beforehand, making that clear to yourself that's prioritization. So that way, when you sit down to get work done, you work on the most important things first. So understanding yourself, learning how to prioritize, and then also creating a structure for yourself. So sometimes you may have a class that just meets once a week, or maybe you have one assignment for the whole semester. And so that takes a lot of self-discipline to kind of like, structure your day for yourself if no one's telling you regularly that you have to keep turning things in to stay on track, right? When I teach an undergraduate class, I got things due every week, multiple times a week to keep them on track to get them to study. But in grad school, I might not have something due, but like twice a semester, right? So it's up to me to set deadlines for myself. So finding a structure for yourself is always going to be helpful. I always say there's six components of a nourishing routine. So having a time to wake up. So even if you don't have a class until later in the evening, I like to set an alarm and say, this is when I'm starting my day, right? <laughs> so having a time to wake up, having a time to go to bed or wind down, like turning your brain off so that you can rest and actually utilize that time to refuel so that you can get ready the next day. Um, having time to eat. We all have to eat. So we have to make time to eat. Um, having time for yourself. So having me time is really important. I often find grad students kind of forget to be people in grad school. So having that time for yourself um, and um, having time to actually get your work done. So important. And then the last time, the last thing, having time, something, some time to move your body, whether it's just going for a walk, going to a workout class, lifting weights, whatever is best for you. If you can have put all six of those things in one day, ah, oh, that feels so good. Oh, yeah. Kenya says sometimes we try to prioritize everything and it becomes overwhelming. Yes. If we prioritize everything, we actually prioritize nothing. <laughs> Absolutely. And for those of you who are just tuning in, welcome. My name is Dr. Arubasa. I have Dr. Toyin here. We're talking about productivity and self-care for graduate students. And we have just been sharing some, and well, not me, but Toya has been sharing some insights on really how you can streamline your graduate school process using productivity and self-care tips. And so Kenya, as um, she said, it sometimes to prioritize everything can become overwhelming. I could definitely agree with that. Um, at times I find like writing a to-do list is just wasting my time, but <laughs> and I just rather do. But having some type of structured system that is perfect for you definitely can agree with. And Kenya says this is very good information. Thank you, Kenya. I told you I'm trying to bring you everything <laughs> to make sure that you are the best scholar that you can be. And so my next question to you, Dr. And we talked about, you know, what productivity is, how you can create your own productivity schedule, but 
what are some of the challenges that people do run in, or encounter, especially as a student who's trying to just put productivity in place, self-care in place, manage deadlines, <laughs> take care of like the when the streets are calling, like family life, <laughs> have fun, take time for themselves. You know, what are some challenges that a person can encounter? And, and are these challenges normal? Oh, yeah, definitely. Let's talk about the one you just mentioned, the to-do list, the dreaded to-do list. <laughs> so I will say not all to-do lists are created equal. And yes, you can write a to-do list incorrectly. Is it not just a list of things you want to do? I mean, it can be, but if you actually want to do the things, it shouldn't be, right? <laughs> so here are some of like my tried and true tips for writing a to-do list. So it kind of, I'll kind of talk like about the mistakes along the way as well. So one thing that people do will like, will be to sit down and just write down everything they want to do for the day. And that is overwhelming because I think the stat is if there's more than five things on a to-do list, we're less likely to actually do anything. So the more you put on to to-do list, the less likely you'll do any of the things on them. So I say, write down everything you need, but don't stop there. Then choose your top three things. So this is what I call the priority list. So the top three things on that to-do list, what are, if you did nothing else for the rest of the day, what three things will make you feel like, okay, I feel like I did something today. Put that at the top. And then... Also, bring in time. We always underestimate, or is it overestimate? No, we underestimate how long things take. We're like, oh, I can knock this out in two hours. Five hours later, we're still working on it. So if you set the intention that you only want to spend a certain amount of time on something, it'll actually keep you more focused because you have a deadline, even though it's self-imposed. So with that priority list, I always recommend writing down, okay, I want to spend three hours on this. Or... By 2 p.m., I'm done with this. I'm moving on. I'll come back to it later. And then I think a huge mistake that happens is people putting huge tasks on the to-do list. Like, I think if something takes more than 45 minutes to get done, it needs to be broken up into subtasks. Otherwise, you're just going to be working on the one thing all day long and still not get it done, right? So, if you can break it down into subtasks, you can start crossing things off that list and it feels so good. Once you do one thing, you're like, oh, that didn't take too long. Let me do the next little subtask and the next little subtask. And it helps you like build, build. Okay, so, oh, someone says, ah, oh, a, a top three from the top five. Yes, that will be helping be productive. Yes, yes, definitely start there. Uh, I think another mistake people make is being too rigid and thinking, oh, I need to manage my time better and be productive. I'm going to set a schedule where every hour of the day is blocked off. Yeah. But then what happens when something unexpected happens? Or maybe you get an email and now you have a meeting and now you can't do the things you said you're going to do. And so like having that rigid, everything blocked off schedule, that kind of sets us up for failure and it, mm -hmm. it doesn't have any room for flexibility. So what I always recommend the grad students that I work with is build in the flexibility in your schedule. So instead of naming everything by name that you're going to do, I recommend productivity chunks. This is what I call them, productivity chunks. So productivity chunks are these two to five hour blocks of time. And the only thing you have to do during that time is be productive. All right, so what do you do? Well, you start with number one on your priority list. That's what you do during that time. But when something comes up, like maybe you have a meeting or maybe you forgot that you had to do this other thing. So when that comes up, as long as you consider yourself to be pr uh, productive during that time, you fulfill the goals of your productivity chunk, right? So I like to schedule productivity chunks every single day. And then I would say maybe one more thing, um, that can help you be more successful is like, or a mistake I would say is sitting down and just working for like three to five hours straight. And then after that, you're like, Oof, I can't even see I'm tired. <laughs> so something that helps me is working in smaller chunks of time. So in my focus accountability group for graduate students, we use the Pomodoro technique. And that's where you work for a certain amount of time then take a little break work for a certain amount of time, take a little break. And after about two or three times, take a bigger break. In our group, we feel like for grad school work, 
45 minutes is a good chunk of time to like really dig into your work. So what we'll do is we'll say, all right, what is one thing you're going to do for the next 45 minutes? Only one goal. That's it. Not the whole to-do list, just one thing. And so 45 minutes, you work on it and then you take a break. Think about how it went. Maybe you finished it. Great. If not, next 45 minutes, what are you going to do? You're going to continue working on that thing until it gets done and taking those breaks. And there's something about giving yourself a certain amount of time to do something that really kind of like reduces the distraction, right? If you give yourself the whole day, you're like, oh, this is gonna take forever. Let me check my email. Let me look at my phone or whatever. But if you only got 45 minutes, you're like, oh, well, I'll just look at my phone after the 45 minutes is done. I'll check my email after the 45 minutes is done. I'm gonna add one more thing to the list, emails. If you're checking your email every time you get an email, that's too much. I check my email three times a day. I check my email in the morning after I write my to-do list. I might need to add something from checking the email. Then I work. Then while I'm eating my lunch, I'll check my email. Then I'll get back to work. And then before I'm done for the day, I'll check my email again. Usually there's nothing so urgent that I just got to be on my inbox, right? Three times a day is enough because just taking the time to like check the email, it takes a long time to kind of reset and restart and get back into that productivity zone after breaking your productivity. So I recommend checking your email as few times a day as possible. All right. That was a lot. Um, for those <laughs> but it was productive. It was good. Um, I definitely use the Pomodoro technique because I'm a person who likes projects. So something that is like montaneous, I, I have to do it for long periods of time, that doesn't work for me. So in, even in my own just practices running business, teaching, I do it in chunks. And I find like that adrenaline for me because I know like I only have an hour to do this. I get stuff done. And I know for those of you who are tuning in, you know that sometimes because you're overwhelmed by everything that you have to do, you wind up doing nothing at all. So I love the tips that you shared. And I'm going to go to the comments. So I see a few people have joined in. So Ehi, hi, Ehi. Thank you for joining. I see Osa has joined. Okay, so we have a comment from Kenya. She says, I never thought of putting a task onto a to-do list that takes more than 45 minutes. No one that I can't get anything done. I get hung up on the big task and then stay there until it's done. Absolutely, Kenya. You got to break that down <laughs> and take breaks. Like, I love that you stress, um, Toyin, to take breaks because people feel, especially in grad school, when the deadlines are there, you're like, oh, I have to meet this deadline. But it, I think this whole planning out in the way that best suits you, that allows you to incorporate a break. And I think in my own experiences, when I can't function, even if I'm trying, I'm at the computer, nothing will come out. Nothing. I'll just be sitting there looking at it and then my phone and all of other things to use to distract. So Kenya, we definitely understand that. Ashley says, I use that method. Okay. And um, Sherlyn, hi, Sherlyn. Welcome. She says, I'm thinking about going to school for health administration. Any advice, please? Okay, so tonight we're taking talking about productivity, self care, and time management. But surely you can send me an email um, at hello at fahelscholars.com. More than happy, you can watch some of the other videos that I have on the channel. That's a ton of healthcare administration advice there. But today we're talking about productivity, self care, and time management with Dr. Toyin. Okay, so Dr. Toyin, you talked about like some technology scheduling in your phone. And so my next question to you is what are some of the tech gear that's your favorite that can help someone in their productivity, time management, and or self care endeavors? <laughs> Oh my goodness, all the things are out there now. So I would say first, before I give a list of things, if you love what you use, use it. Like the best tool is the best tool for you, right? So, um, but a tool that I learned about after I finished grad school and I was like, man, I wish I knew I, I knew about this in grad school was Trello. I love yes. Trello so much. It's such <laughs> an easy way to like stay organized. And I love the like drag feature. You can drag things around. So things aren't like as set in stone and it gives you that like flexibility. And so what I like to do with Trello is 
I make a list of all of the things that I usually do, whether it's like reading or homework or writing or whatever. I write a list and put that on the side and then I drag it into my days where I'm doing my productivity chunks. And it's just nice to like have everything digital. Um, what I like about Trello is because they have an app too. You can just add, if you think of something, you can add it in via the app on your phone and it syncs everywhere, which is great. And so I actually created a whole toolkit for graduate students where you can just like steal my Trello boards. I got them set up just for graduate students. So that would be the first thing that I discovered that I started recommending to graduate students to like keep track because like keeping everything on paper it's easy to get lost in the shuffle and I'm a paper person. So you'll find that I have a paper planner. I got a whiteboard planner and I got it on the computer planner. I do it all because I just like to stay organized. So I would say Trello number one. And now I've gotten into Notion. I made a Notion template for grad students. The thing I like about Notion is you can turn everything into a document. So like you can keep track of all of your readings and your writings inside of Notion. And I find that grad students really, really like that. Um, there's also something called the Forest app. And basically it tracks your productivity. And so like when you're working, you're like building out your forest of trees. And like when you're not working, the trees start dying and you lose the trees. So that's like a little visual cue to help keep you motivated. Um, there are also things like Toggle, T-O-G-G-L, which is like a Chrome extension. So something that I recommend for students who really struggle with how long things take. Like a lot of students struggle with planning out their days because they just have no idea how long it takes to get anything done. So they like, they like overwhelm themselves because they put too much in the day without realizing it. And so what I like to do is kind of like audit my time where I take a week and I write down everything that I'm doing and exactly how long it takes. I usually do it by hand, but the Toggle app helps you keep track of how long all of your tasks are taking. And that way you can use the information from tracking your time and build out next week even better, right? You have more data and you have more information about how long things take so you can plan a little better. So those are some resources that I like. I love that. And you said you have a toolkit. So if you share that link with me, I'll blast it out to our email list and um, definitely support you and that initiative. So if you're new to the channel, sign up for our For Health Scholars newsletter. By tomorrow, you'll get an email from me recapping everything that we talked about on tonight's live. But if you're tuning in, um, just tuning in, welcome. I'm here talking to our lovely guest, Dr. Toyan, who is giving us some great advice on how to just manage productivity, self-care, and time management as a graduate student. But you can use this as an undergraduate student as well. Um, but we know how grad school can be <laughs> at times. As, okay, so my next question to you, Dr. Toyan, is let's talk about burnout, right? Because as people are getting all of this software and we're telling them, them these things to do, how do you truly manage burnout? And um, is it even something that can we avoid that as a graduate student? I call it the procrastination burnout cycle. It's real and it's hard to get out. So here's what happens. Okay, so you're in grad school the first month, you're like excited, like, oh my gosh, finally I get to study the thing that I actually care about. Let me get to this work. Let me um, work on all of this. And then um, you, the, I call it the big three happens where maybe you your grades don't reflect the amount of time that you spend working on the assignment. You're like disappointed in the grades that you're getting. You're like, oh, my gosh, what is happening? I used to be a straight A student. Why am I failing these assignments? Why am I getting C's? Like what is going on? The math is not mathing. I'm working hard. So you hit that like you that failure, that feeling of failure in grad school, which we all experience. And then when that failure happens, you start to feel like, oh, well, should I be here? Am I like qualified to be in this program? You start to feel like an imposter, like a fraud, like everybody, maybe everybody else is more qualified to be here. And let me just be quiet so they don't notice me and they don't notice I'm not supposed to be here. Right. That imposter syndrome happens. And then when we have that failure and we get that imposter syndrome, 
then we start to be a little slow to start our work because it's like, why work on this assignment if I know I'm not going to do well? And I don't like that feeling. So I'll procrastinate. So the procrastination happens. And so then when the procrastination happens, you wait until the last minute to start working on the assignment. And so when you wait until the last minute, you're working all night, working for hours on end. You don't have time to take a break because you waited until the last minute. And so you get it done, but afterwards you're exhausted. You're hitting burnout. It's like, ooh, I don't want to go through that again. So when you get the next assignment, you remember the burnout. You remember how awful it felt. And so you procrastinate. But when you procrastinate, you got to work a lot at the last minute and that causes you to burn out and then you procrastinate and then you burn out again. So it's like a whole vicious cycle that's really hard to get out. And so burn, because there's so much work and you talked about the academic rigor before, it's so easy to burn out in grad school. And so what I, what my recommendation is, is understand why it's happening. So the procrastination, that's just an avoidance strategy. It's like a strategy that we use to kind of like keep ourselves safe to not have to try to do the work. And so the way to overcome that and and then overcome burnout is to apply another strategy. So there's different reasons why we procrastinate. Maybe we want to avoid a task and we don't see why it's important. And so we kind of like avoid doing it. And so the way that I like to overcome that is give myself just a small window of time to do it, right? Usually for me, unfortunately, when students ask me to write a letter of recommendation, I'm happy to write them a letter of recommendation, but somehow it falls to the bottom of my to-do list every day. I don't get paid for writing letters of recommendation. I got to prepare for class. I got a grade. And so what I do is I say, okay, well, I have a meeting at 9 a.m. I'm going to write this letter of recommendation from 8.30 to 9. And I always get it done in that small little bit of time. So one thing I would recommend to do to avoid burnout is give yourself a smaller window of time to do something so that you actually do it. Also, sometimes we have this fear of failure. And so that's the reason why we procrastinate. So we think, well, I can't fail if I never do it, if I never start. And so getting over that fear of failure is going to be really helpful. So having techniques, well, maybe just start with the smallest first step, or maybe even planning out, well, what's the worst case scenario if I try? What's the worst thing that can happen? What's the best thing that can happen? So figuring out what self-talk works for you to get you to overcome that fear of um, uh, fear of failure. Sometimes perfectionism can also hold us back. And that's a reason why we procrastinate because we want it to be perfect. But unfortunately, in grad school, we don't have enough time to make things perfect and like live up to our perfect standards. Sometimes done is just enough. You just got to get it done and move on with your life. So figuring out how can I just get something done? How can I just start? And that will help you because a lot of times we spend a lot of time thinking about making something perfect and that can cause us to burn out as well. And then sometimes we'll procrastinate and burn out because we're not sure where to start. We're like unclear on the assignment or unclear on what you're being asked to do. And so that can kind of like paralyze you and make you procrastinate because you don't really know what you're doing. Always talk to someone about it, right? And pro tip to talk to someone who's done the thing before, whether it's your professor or another graduate student. When I'm like not sure about my next steps, I just like ask my hey, can I talk through this thing? And they literally don't have to say a word. I will just talk through why I'm confused. And I always end up with a next step, like a first step. So I would say procrastination is very much related to burnout. And so the thing to do is to figure out how to overcome the procrastination. So that's one way to overcome burnout. Another way is you got to get the rest. Sometimes we just be tired. You got to take the break. Maybe that assignment has to be turned in late. Maybe you get a late grade. Maybe you get an extension, but you have to rest. Like there's no way around it. You got to rest and that will help you bounce back. And then also having structure in your day. So having time to work and fully separating your work time from your me time and not like, on the couch with your document open while you're watching TV. Don't mix the two, right? Because you're still working, right? Completely separate. And that will help with the burnout too. I always tell people uh, procrastination can 
be the enemy of your progress. Oh my gosh, it has happened to me. And once I understood that concept, especially in my doctoral program, because for the most part, undergrad, master's program, those were doable for me. But when I got to the doctoral level and I bypass, you know, finish all of my didactic courses and it was time to start writing the dissertation. Oh man, <laughs> it was like, I was trying to figure it out. And then um, a good friend of mine was like, listen, a done dissertation is better than a perfect dissertation. So for those of you who are struggling with perfectionism and, and that's holding you back, listen, the person with the C's, I mean, they, they get far, you know, it's like, you need to get it done. And you, you not to say that you kind of lose all of the per principles of writing, etc. but you have done it enough where it's suitable to get the grade that you need so that you can move forward and achieve that degree. So thank you, um, Twain, for that. And Ebony says, yes, that's me about five months ago. Burnout is no joke. It is definitely no joke. And it can paralyze you for real. Like you may feel lethargic. You may feel like you can't do anything. You can't think straight. And that can be all contributors to your burnout. So I thank you, Dr. Twain, for sharing your insight. C's, <laughs> he's laughing at me. C's get the degrees too. <laughs> long as you are passing <laughs> and um absolutely but it, that's the truth and so um dr Twain, you talked about this concept of okay when you're feeling burnout just take a break and not feel guilty about that and i i love that sentiment especially as an academic you know for many people who look at us as professors they're like oh professors don't understand <laughs> They want their work and it's true. We want our work. But as a professor, you know, when you have those students who just need to share it out with you, um, what are the things that you tell them when they want to kind of figure out how to overcome a hurdle that they have? What is it that they should say to the professor to get a response of, okay, just let's talk it out. Because I think for so many students, they're afraid to talk to their professors and they are afraid to share with the professor that they're having an issue in a given assignment or just understanding some material. So as a fellow academic professor in the field, what advice can you give to a student who needs to talk to their professor but don't know how? Yes, that's such a great question. I will first start by saying I love when my students come to me and let me know when they're struggling or something because it, it lets me know what's going on. And I feel like so proud of them. I'm like, oh, yes, they're going in the right. They're going in the right direction if they're telling me about what is going on. They always have these like unfortunate stories where students will like not turn in assignments for weeks on end or I won't see them and then they'll come to the final exam do horribly and then they'll email me and say is there anything I can do I have really been struggling I've been struggling with mental health I've been sick my grandparent I've had to take care of my grandparent is there anything I can do and it's like well it's the end of the semester all the grades have been given there's nothing that I can do right now I wish you would have told me about this before I would have extended some deadlines. I would have given you another ch more chances. I would have like if you had just let me know before something could have been done. And so what I always tell students is even if it's small, just tell me what the, if you're having an issue. You don't even have to tell me exactly what the issue is. I had a student email me saying, I have been going to a lot of interviews this week and I've gotten behind on the work. Thank you so much for telling me. I know that you're not being lazy now, right? I know what is happening. And it kind of gives me a clearer lens on what's happening with my students. And I'm not judging them for like being lazy or not showing up. Um, so I do think it's really important to have communication with your professor. Um, I know not every professor will feel the same as me, but I think the transparency is better than nothing. Absolutely. I, I'm, I'm in agreement with that. I always tell my students, don't suffer in silence. Don't sit in silence. Don't be confused in silence because I can't help you. And don't wait to the last minute in silence because at the end of the semester I'm not really trying to hear anything <laughs> I want to submit my grade and take the break but I'm very much like you like if you speak up and because life happens and that's that's the honest truth. Life happens. And just because you're a student, life doesn't stop. And um, I definitely just 
appreciate a fellow academic just sharing like, hey, just speak up. The worst that you can get is that the professor is going to be no, or I'm going to deduct some points because they have to be fair and not give you a fair advantage. But but do speak up. And so um, my last question to you before we head out for the night, and once again, for those of you who are tuning in, thank you so much. If you have questions because we're getting ready to round up, just drop them now because I don't want to dominate too much of Dr. Toyin's time, right? And I guess my question, it's not a question, question, but rather I ask for you, what are some words of encouragement that you can give to an upcoming scholar, whether they're in healthcare or not, in the um, in, as they embark on a graduate degree, whether it's master's or doctorate, what's some words of encouragement that you can offer? Yes, this is such a great question. So the first thing is really be deeply connected to why you want to do this, right? It needs to be deeper than I want the letters behind my name or I want to make more money. There needs to be the graduate school experience is so tough and you're going to like want to quit. But the thing that kept me in my program was knowing that this is what this is why I'm here. Like I am here because of X, Y, Z, whether it's you want to solve a problem. Maybe it's a subject you've always loved. Maybe this is the thing that really like you feel in your heart that you should be doing. So being deeply connected to that why and being able to go back to it every time you're like, oh, why am I doing this again? And you're like, oh, this is the reason. So that's the first thing, knowing why you're doing it. And then number two, go in there with a plan. I see too many grad students just kind of let grad school happen to them and they're stressed and they're overwhelmed and they're doing things that's not, that they don't actually care about. And so going into grad school with a purpose and a plan and having goals for yourself while you're in the program will direct your path. Like there are going to be times where you have lots of assignments, lots of but almost like competing things that you have to do connecting back to the why and back to your goals will give you the direction. So if you're ever figure, feeling like, oh, I don't know what to start working on first, I'm kind of stuck here. You want to be able to go back to those goals. I always have my grad students start with the semester with two big goals. What are the big goals that you have for this semester? And everything you should, everything you're doing, everything that you're prioritizing should be related to those goals. Um, and then, um, talk to people, right? Meet the people in your cohort, actually make friends and network in grad school because that, they're also going through this unique experience with you. So they really understand what you're going through. And it's, uh, grad school can be kind of isolating. And I think if you have people that you can talk to about the experience, you'll feel less isolating and it'll be a more enjoyable experience. I love that response. And I'm always like screaming at the top of my lungs, like network, 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 network. Okay. That is going to take you far. And if you start in grad school, it is just only setting yourself up for post-grad success. And so Dr. Toya, I just really want to thank you for being our first guest on the For Health Scholars channel, number one. And then number two, for all of the amazing advice that you have provided tonight. As you can see for the comments and the questions, us as scholars in the field, they really, really need it. So we appreciate all of the work that you do. Also, um, Dr. Tony is going to send me a link to, I think she says she has a toolkit that um, she offers to graduate students. So I'll, if you're on the For Health Scholars email list, that is where I'm going to send that link out. All right. So I'm not going to send it on like LinkedIn or anything. So make sure you sign up for the For Health Scholars newsletter. This is the final call for questions. Um, but once again, um, Dr. Toyin, thank you so much for sharing this. And for those of you who came on late, how I met her, um, she is a mentor of mine. She encouraged me to do the For Health Scholars platform because I was like, oh, I don't know. <laughs> and she's like, just do it. Just definitely do it. Your knowledge is needed. So as you can see, she is a great person to tap into for your productivity, time management, um, self-care, but also if you're an academic, because we do have a few academics like um, postdoctoral candidates on who may be interested in doing their own initiative and kind of sharing their knowledge in, in a business forum, you can definitely keep in touch with her as well. Um, she does help you with that. So, um, okay, I'm going to check. I don't see any more questions in the queue. 
But once again, thank you all for tuning in. And uh, Dr. Toyin, um, anything else you want to share with us? Did I, I cover everything? <laughs> I think you got everything. I just want to say thank you for inviting me. I love sharing this stuff. Thank you to everybody in the comments for like participating. And I just wanted to say the For Health Scholars platform, you are killing it. I, it's so oh, hard to believe you just started. You like, has it even been a year yet? No, it hasn't. <laughs> no, wow. it's just uh, like maybe six months now. Wow, you are killing it. So I'm wow. so like proud of you. Thank Amazing. you. Yes. Thank you. Oh, okay, we have some uh, from Kenya. It says, please come back. I need both of you ladies to get through my master's program the advice and information is absolutely amazing and appreciated so you can connect with us on youtube we love youtube so dr torian she has her channel the academic society on youtube does it have an underscore at your yeah, handle yeah. or no okay yeah, so it's just the academic okay society also connect with us at the for health scholars i i do my monthly live q and a's and videos leave your comments so we're definitely here to support you, Kenya, as a fellow um, Black woman trying to get educated in degrees. We are here for you. So thank you for supporting me and Dr. Toyin tonight by joining tonight's live. Okay, I don't see anyone else in the queue. All right. Well, Dr. Toyin, once again, thank you, thank you, thank you. Of course, we're staying connected. Um, but I look forward to maybe something in the future. <laughs> as the demand is that we're wanting you back. All right. But um, for those of you tuning in, thank you so much. Have a great night. And until the next video, bye for now.